The call of Jesus is a radical call, a call to be radically gracious in conflict, a call to be radically truthful in speech, a call to be radically faithful in marriage. And I imagine that each one of us, we felt that call hit home in one area or another. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. Today we continue our message, Living Out True Righteousness. And, you know, I think of the radical call of Jesus on our lives. And that means that as we come to know him, we ought to expect change and maybe even some pretty drastic change from the person we were before we came into that relationship with Jesus. Absolutely listening to, reading the teaching of Jesus on the nature of the Christian life and what it is he calls us to, it's immensely challenging. It's actually very, very uncomfortable, even for those who've been believers for some time, to see that the standards of Jesus are so very high. And I find, as I read Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, I I find I, I have to turn to him and ask for his mercy and his grace and his help by his Spirit to be what I I simply can't be on my own. Yeah, I think uh, all of us, if we have walked with Jesus for any length of time, know what that's like to uh, cry out to him and ask him to work like that in our lives. Uh, Today, we're going to continue to look at this from Matthew chapter 5. We're looking at verses 21 to 48 today as we continue our message, Living Out True Righteousness. Here is Jonathan. The second part of his call, very briefly, is this. He calls us to truth in speech. Verse 33, again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, not by any place or anything. Then down to verse 37, simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Evidently, in the Judaism of Jesus' day, an elaborate system of oath-taking had developed whereby the seriousness of an oath was judged by the thing or the person you swore it by. The closer you got to swearing by anything related to the Lord himself, the more binding the oath became. That's why Jesus talks here about swearing by heaven or earth or Jerusalem, etc., What's going on here in the background is that the oath has become non-binding if it is not directly related to the Lord. And so actually oaths, in a kind of circuitous way, oaths had become actually an occasion for bending the truth rather than speaking it and confirming it with sincerity. If someone swore to you by heaven that they were going to do something, that might mean that there was an 85% chance that they were actually going to do it. Heaven is, after all, pretty closely related to the Lord. If someone swore to you by Jerusalem that they were going to do something, maybe, I don't know, there was a 70% chance that they were going to do it. It's a bit further, you know, than heaven from the Lord, but it's still very important. Pretty close to the Lord, but a step down. And so I, I wouldn't hold my breath necessarily that it's going to happen. And in this way, oaths became an opportunity to sound serious on the one hand, but to avoid an absolute commitment on the other. And so what we've got here is a culture in which truth has become negotiable. And against that backdrop, Jesus says that his people must be marked by a simple and straightforward adherence to the truth. It mustn't take a solemn oath for a kingdom person to actually speak the truth and to be relied upon to speak the truth. It's simply got to be what we do whenever we open our mouths. We speak the truth. But like the days of Jesus, we live in a day where dishonesty is so often simply assumed. That's how things are. It's what we've come to expect. We're instinctively skeptical, aren't we, of the people we do business with. We're skeptical about politicians We regularly doubt the truth and veracity of the news reports that we read and hear. We're used to hearing lies. We've heard them plenty. And far too easily, you and I become accustomed to speaking them as well. How hard we find it to refrain from massaging the facts just a little bit to make ourselves look a little bit better. 
how hard we find it to resist omitting details from an account to save ourselves trouble or guilt. How easy we find it to forget about commitments that we've made, to fail to do things we said we would. How easy we find it to let down our friends and our family, our colleagues and our neighbors, because we don't stick to what we've said we'd do. But Jesus says that his people are to be people of simple truth, of consistent reliability. Our word is to be our bond, our testimony, truth without exception. Grace in conflict, truth in speech, and finally, the third element of the call of Jesus, fidelity in marriage. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Any God-fearing Jew would know the commandment, do not commit adultery, and each one of us here, whatever our religious background and knowledge of Scripture, would be familiar with that as well. But like in Jesus' day, many of us here today might feel that we have managed to keep that important commandment if we have not had a physical relationship with someone who is not our spouse. But where we might congratulate ourselves for obedience, for keeping the commandments, for keeping the letter of the law, Jesus instead brings a deep challenge at the level of heart and mind. You've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In a sense, the words of Jesus in verse 28, they speak for themselves, and the challenge is clear enough without a great deal of extra comment. But we do need to acknowledge, frankly, today that this is one area where we as a society have completely lost our bearings, and it's an area where the Christian church is very deeply compromised. It's an area of challenge in any time and in any age. It was, of course, a challenge for the first listeners of Jesus' sermon. That's why he bothered to say it then. But we today do live in an era where the standards of public decency have plummeted, where what is acceptable in terms of sexual content in mainstream broadcasting, it's changed rapidly and where the internet has created this whole new realm of completely unregulated media content. And the result of all those factors is that our society is now experiencing what we all know is an epidemic of addiction, really, to sexually explicit imagery. I could cite all kinds of shocking statistics to reinforce the point, the money value of the pornography industry, which is astounding, the huge levels of use of the material, the impact on children and teens, the ramifications for marriage, but I think we're all familiar with the realities. I don't think we need a whole lot of convincing that this is one of the great social crises of our age, and I don't think I need to convince you that it has torn through the church and is destroying Christian marriages and homes. It is shipwrecking the testimony of many, many believers. That's the reality. And many folks in this room will be currently in the depths of a crisis linked to this very issue, a personal addiction, a child for whom you're concerned because they've become caught up in this, a marriage in crisis, a family torn apart. The problem is real. The impact on the church is catastrophic. But what do we do? What is our response? Where do we go from here? Because it seems so hopeless. Well, if any words of Jesus speak into this crisis, it's surely the words of verses 29 to 30. What does Jesus say to the person who is tempted to look adulterously at another person who is caught in a dreadful pattern? of doing so. Verse 29, here is the instruction of Jesus. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. 
What's Jesus saying here? Is he saying that we should quite literally gouge out our eyes and cut off our hands if this is a problem for us? Well, no, I do think he is using some hyperbole, some exaggeration to make a very serious point. He's telling us to be radical. He is telling us to be outrageously radical in dealing with this particular issue. He's telling us to take steps that we might well view as outrageous and absurd, costly and painful, excessive and drastic. He is urging us to take those steps in order to keep ourselves from temptation in this particular area. And as he urges his people to take those steps, he sets out for us the compelling reason for taking them. It might sound drastic to gouge out an eye or cut off a hand, but here is the bottom line. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It is worth taking whatever costly steps are necessary, however drastic they are, to deal with this sin because the stakes are immensely high. They could not be higher. So what might it mean to take the kind of drastic action that Jesus is speaking of here? What if you're someone who has a particular sin problem in this particular area? What do you do? The key seems to be to identify where the points of danger are. If your eye causes you to sin, says Jesus, if your hand causes you to sin, gouge it out, cut it off, he says. Taking that principle of drastic action, the question then becomes, where are the places where you are tempted to sin? What are the things that provide occasion to sin? For many today, it will, of course, be electronic devices connected to the internet. I think we all know that's the case. That's the big issue. That is the point of temptation for many. And if that's the case for you, then drastic action with those devices and with that access is what is needed. If it's your smartphone, then may I suggest you need to take drastic action with your smartphone. If you simply are not managing self-control with the internet in your pocket, take the word of Jesus seriously. Gouge it out, cut it off. Take that pretty iPhone that you love so much, and let me suggest, put it down on your driveway behind the back wheel of your car, and put your car into reverse and drive backwards over it. Then put your car into drive and drive forwards over it. Repeat as many times as necessary. Smash it. Get rid of it. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body or an extension of your body, that smartphone that's glued to your hand. It's better to lose that than for your whole body to go into hell. I couldn't survive without my iPhone, you say. Well, let me say to you frankly and with much love, you can survive without an iPhone. You survived without it before it was invented, and you'd manage just fine without it again. If you're unable to exercise self-control with it, get rid of it. If it's your computer at home, let me suggest take up a pair of sharpened kitchen scissors and cut your internet cable. Cancel the subscription. Take drastic action. I couldn't survive without a broadband connection at home, you say. Human beings have survived without the internet for millennia. We can all manage without it just fine if we need to. It will be a nuisance for sure, it'll be an inconvenience, but it is worth the cost. It's worth all the cost. If your right eye causes you to sin, if your broadband connection causes you to sin, gouge it out, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body, better to lose your web connectivity than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Maybe it's your flat screen TV with its 500 cable channels or Netflix subscription or whatever it is you have. If you're unable to exercise self-control and discretion in what you watch, here is the solution. Cancel your subscription. Put the flat screen TV on Kijiji and use the money to buy some good books. Deal with it. Take drastic action. Maybe it's a particular person. Maybe it's a particular place. Stop seeing that person. Don't go to that place. Maybe it's a colleague at work. There's just some spark there, and you can't seem to get past it. How about this? Quit your job. 
and find another one. Drastic, yes, but isn't that what the Lord Jesus is talking about here? Cut off your hand, he says, gouge out your eye. Anything to avoid shipwrecking your faith. Anything, he says, to avoid the ultimate judgment of God. What do you need to do? What drastic steps do you need to take, even today, in response to this call and this warning from the lips of Jesus? Before we leave this topic, it is worth just saying and acknowledging that some will take a whole series of very drastic steps, but still be stuck in a dreadful cycle. And there seems to be a pattern akin to addiction and little hope of escape. And it is true that in some cases, professional help is needed and can be a tremendous help. It's worth knowing that there is help available. And if you need to explore that further, please do speak to one of the pastors here because we'd love to point you in the right direction. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth. Our message is called Living Out True Righteousness. And, you know, it is good to know that there is help available. And if you maybe could use some help, some of the resources that Jonathan was referencing, then you can always contact us here at Encounter the Truth. We'd love to uh, help as we're able. The phone number to call, 1-833-99-TRUTH. That's 833-998-7884. Well, I do hope you'll stay with us. Uh, we're going to get back to this message from Jonathan in just one moment, but I do want to let you know that if you ever miss a broadcast, if you join us late, if you have to leave early, or you want to go back and listen to a program again, you can always do that through our website. Just come to EncounterTheTruth.org. You can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. You can also listen with the Encounter the Truth app. Simply look for that at your favorite app store. Again, just look for Encounter the Truth. Well, let's get back to the message. Once again, here is Jonathan. In the next verses, Jesus continues to deal with the topic of adultery, but he changes topic now, and he focuses specifically on the question of divorce. Verse 31. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Speaking into a world where the Old Testament limitations on divorce had become, at least for some people in Judaism in that day, had become a license for divorce for almost any cause, speaking into that context, Jesus has something radical yet again to say. The person who divorces his wife, except for one particular reason that we'll come to, the person who divorces his wife causes her to become an adulteress. Now, the background here is that the divorced woman would need to seek remarriage as a means of financial support in a, an economy where men were the main breadwinners. And so the husband who divorces his wife, who casts her off and places her in a position of needing to remarry to survive, he makes her an adulteress. And why is that so? It's so because whatever a court may say, the original marriage remains binding on her. And so remarriage actually becomes an act of adultery. And similarly, anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery, says Jesus. What's the point that Jesus is making? Why is he branding remarriage adultery? The point he's making is that marriage is a more significant a deeper, a more binding union than people realized. It can't just be broken by any old divorce. It's not that easy. A certificate of divorce may be written up, but the marriage bond is not broken simply by a piece of paper. And so another marriage counts as adultery. Later in Matthew's gospel, Jesus will remind us of the basis of marriage at creation. There was something profound in the union of Adam and Eve, something God-given. He made them one flesh, we read, and it was something that was never designed to be broken in this life. If Jesus was speaking into a context of casual and easy divorce in his day 2,000 years ago, that trend has only increased in ours. Divorce is so common in our society as to be hardly worthy of note or of comment. Some marriages work, some marriages don't work, and it's nothing to get too wound up about, 
our society says. That's what the world says. That's the context in which we live. But Jesus insists that the standards of the kingdom are altogether different, altogether higher. Whatever the world around us may say, marriage is still the permanent one flesh union that God created it to be at the very beginning. And there's no such thing as casual divorce for the believer. Here in these verses, in this chapter, there's only one case in which Jesus allows for divorce and the possibility of remarriage, and that's the case where there has been marital unfaithfulness, verse 32. He doesn't define precisely the nature of this sexual immorality and marital unfaithfulness, but presumably the logic here is that an act of marital unfaithfulness breaks and defiles the one flesh union of marriage the offended spouse cannot be bound to stay married to the unfaithful partner, although, of course, they're not bound to leave either. But divorce becomes a genuine possibility, and remarriage after such a divorce, says Jesus, is not adulterous because this marriage bond has been broken in a fundamental way. That seems to be the logic and the implication here. Jesus' statement here is very brief. It's not all that he has to say on this important subject. He's going to elaborate a little bit more in Matthew chapter 19. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul will add one further possibility of a legitimate divorce in the case of a person becoming a believer and their unbelieving spouse being unwilling to stay with them. Again, in that case where an unbelieving partner has abandoned a believing spouse, there seems to be freedom for divorce. Those seem to be the two clear possibilities within the New Testament for allowable divorce. And so we encounter here, yet again, a radical ethic on the lips of Jesus, a countercultural way of life. And the point is clear enough, isn't it? Marriage is for life, and the people of Jesus don't live by the world standard of easy divorce when things grow stale or when things get difficult or very complicated, as they sometimes do. The call of Jesus on the life of a believer is a radical call, a call to be radically gracious in conflict, a call to be radically truthful in speech, a call to be radically faithful in marriage. And I imagine that each one of us, as we've listened and as we've reflected on the words of Jesus, we felt that challenge and that call hit home, particularly forcefully in one area or another. And as we feel that challenge, and as the word of Jesus hits home for us, we need to remember again his dual purpose here. He's driving us to the cross, where we failed, where his word highlights our guilt, he is pushing us to the end of the story. He is pushing us to Calvary, where he died in our place to bear our guilt that we might be forgiven for the ways in which we have failed to live up to his perfect standards. But he's also calling us. He's calling us to live in a radically different way by the help of his spirit. He is calling us to a standard of righteousness a standard of perfection which we cannot attain on our own. But praise God, by His Spirit, through His daily help, as we rest on Him, He's able to change us, and He's able to make us the people He called us to be. Jonathan Griffiths today reminding us of the call of Jesus for His people, that we're to have truth in speech and fidelity in marriage. You're listening to Encounter the Truth, and we're able to bring you Jonathan's program each and every day because of your generosity. So thanks to those who are giving. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book about five young men who back in 1956 went into the jungles of Ecuador to establish communication with a fierce tribe there. Now, the only previous response to the outside world had been an attack on strangers. But these guys wanted to bring the gospel to that tribe and ended up dying at the end of Spears. One of the widows, Elizabeth Elliot, has written the story of this in a book called Through Gates of Splendor. We'd love to send you a copy as you give a gift of any amount. Give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 1-833-99-TRUTH. That's 1-833-998-7884 or again, EncounterTheTruth.org. 
Well, thanks for doing that, and I hope you'll join us next time.